Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's a great audience. We appreciate your spending your time with us. Uh, my name is Dan Hamilton. I'm a professor here at SAIS at Johns Hopkins and uh, Foreign Policy Institute Fellow. Uh, one of the things we do is uh, we have a postdoctoral program on uh, the United States, Europe, and World Order. We have a number of postdoctoral fellows who are here at SAIS this year with us uh, doing their work. Uh, and one of them uh, had just finished a book before she got here, and we were really delighted to help uh, publicize it and the first public release uh, of the book. So uh, Cornelia Adriana Baciu, who is here as a uh, postdoc fellow, um, has this uh, new book. So Peace, Security, and Defense Cooperation in Post-Brexit Europe, pretty timely. Uh, and uh, she's been working on that with her colleagues uh, in Europe on those questions. So we thought the context of the book would be good uh, to talk about a very timely issue now, which is uh, what's going on with Brexit? What does it mean uh, not only for uh, the UK and the EU member states, but also for broader security issues, which have start to affect, of course, the US interests uh, quite intensely. So uh, what we'll do is I will just briefly introduce the speakers. You have had an invitation and so on uh, more about their backgrounds, but just to keep it brief, um, I'm going to have Cornelia tell us a little bit briefly about the book. And then we're going to go to two uh, colleagues, uh, Alice Panier, who is an assistant professor here at SAIS, who does work on these issues and teaches courses on the issues. Uh, and John Denny, who's a research professor at the US Army War College, who works on translating security issues and has specialized in this topic. Uh, and Eric Bratberg, who uh, was a fellow with, uh, with me for many years, is now uh, two doors down at the Carnegie Endowment working on uh, Europe, uh, will offer a, a further perspective. We're very delighted to have uh, Ambassador uh, Mulhall here with us from the Ambassador of Ireland to the United States. Uh, he has a great perspective on this because he also was ambassador in the UK, and he has a, so he, he can convey some of the reality also from his time uh, there. And he, uh, welcome back, Mr. Ambassador. We're so delighted uh, you could join us again uh, here at SAIS. So without further ado, uh, let me turn to Cornelia, who's going to uh, tell us a bit about the context, uh, and then we'll go from there. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this book launch on Brexit, uh, European security, and transatlantic relations. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hamilton, for this very nice introduction. Um, so, um, as we mentioned, this is the book we are launching today, and um, I would like to say a few things. Um, just wanted to check my time. Um, so the book is um, is an academic um, uh, project, is a collective project with different uh, contributors uh, from uh, various universities in Europe. And uh, in relation to the genesis of this book, uh, so the idea, uh, the idea of the book has uh, materialized at the University of Hamburg uh, during the ECPR conference, a European conference for political research, uh, last summer. Um, so this is where we, um, we we have started, and we decided to um, put together these contributions to to have a greater understanding um, of the subject matter. And uh, before coming to telling you uh, something, uh, or some of the major findings, um, I would like to say a few words to put this in a broader context. Um, so, like to put the, the role of the research and researchers. Um, in the 21st century in a broader context so that you can better understand how we reach the conclusions of uh, this book. So um, uncertainty, insecurity and crisis, um, as we know, are some of the major um, hazards in the 21st century uh, international security order. And in this context, the role of uh, academic research is uh, to generate a body of knowledge which can help us to understand, to explain, or predict crisis and insecurity. Um, and, but, of course, it is not easy to predict um, uncertainty or to know uncertainty uh, because, uh, yeah, the question is how, how do we know if it's uncertain? Um, and a professor uh, of mine um, at Dublin City University during a talk this year has made actually a very interesting point um, referring to a picture which probably most of you or many of you have seen uh, this year, that of a black hole. 
Um, so NASA found a way to know something which was previously unknown and which uh, was difficult to know. And how did they do it? They put together several telescopes. And this is what we tried to do in this book as well. So we tried to put together the pieces of, uh, the, pieces of the puzzle in order to estimate more complex variables, uh, which can help us better predict and understand. Uh, so the objective now coming to the book, the objective of the book was to, um, to fill a crucial scientific gap and uh, to contribute to a better understanding and management of the challenges associated with the uh, uh, Brexit process for European security and uh, transatlantic uh, cooperation. And uh, the book is based on an understanding of peace and security, um, uh, drawing on uh, resilience, anticipation and integration of aspects of daily life, which, has, which are important for um, uh, predicting uncertainty. Um, so now I think I will come to the findings um, which we can categorize in, um, in four major um, um, themes or sections. Uh, the first finding is related to the uh, EU-UK collaborative um, uh, potential. So here we, um, we, the findings suggest that there is a mixed uh, track record of EU-UK military cooperation um, and um, reaching an agreement in the area of uh, security and defense has been has proved more difficult than expected uh, because mainly because of uh, uh, diverging interests of the UK on one side and um, and, and the EU. Um, so interestingly, um, security and defense was, was an area where uh, we would have expected an easy agreement. Um, however, the development after the Brexit vote, um, as I said, had made reaching an agreement increasingly difficult. Um, another um, Another uh, major category of findings relates to the future of Europe. And uh, when we talk about the future of Europe, uh, we need to talk about the future of CSDP, the Common Security and Defense Policy. Um, and here, um, our findings suggest that, uh, or highlight the role of policy entrepreneurs, such as uh, France and Germany, in mm, making advancements um, uh, for CSDP. Um, and um, but still, challenges are expected to uh, to continue in the future because um, because of the difference in the strategic preferences um, of these two po po major policy entrepreneurs, but also EU twenty seven. Um, nonetheless, we can expect um, increased cooperation for lifting obstacles um, in in the future for CSDP. Um, another um, um, aspect also in this category, um, the future of Europe, is related to, um, um, to peace. Um, and because when we talk about the future of Europe, we, we need to think about this essential aspect. Uh, peace is, an, is a major attribute of um, European integration. It is um, a prerequisite also for other EU membership benefits, uh, such as the economic or political cooperation. And uh, the findings uh, have highlighted how uh, the, the Brexit process can, or, or Brexit can undermine or undermines the um, uh, Northern Ireland peace process and the Good Friday Agreement, because um, the, um, the Good Friday Agreement was, was possible due to the uh, uh, EU membership of both countries, the UK and Ireland, um, and uh, open-ended uh, nature of the of the peace process in the uh, in Northern Ireland, and uh, I'm sure Ambassador Moha will uh, say more about this later on. Um, another important thing was related to uh, which we found was related to bilateralism. So we could expect that um, the EU, uh, the UK uh, will strengthen or or relations with uh, individual member states will be strengthened on a bilateral basis. Uh, and we had a case study uh, in our book on uh, Estonia. So the findings suggest that um, individual member states in a difficult strategic environment or in threat exposure such as ex uh, Estonia can have an increased utility for the UK, uh, particularly because um, cooperation on a bilateral basis can constitute 
uh, and avenues of influence for the EU policy or on the EU policy. Then uh, we have um, we have a third uh, category of findings which uh, relates to new sources of power and legitimacy, and here we assessed whether and how uh, new and emerging security technologies can be turned or can turn into a competitive advantage for the EU. Um, another thing we looked at uh, was the potential of collaborative um, uh, defense, uh, security and defense um, um, regimes uh, and procurement and uh, European Defense Fund. Uh, and also uh, we looked at the future of the European nuclear deterrence. Um, and finally, there was a fourth category related to post-Brexit uh, uh, strategies. So here we find a greater need for, um, so we find the need for, the findings suggest the need for a greater, for a more holistic uh, EU agenda. Um, holistic in the sense that um, um, peace and uh, cooperative strategies should aim at um, fulfilling or um, yeah fulfilling both both uh, system stability system resilience so um, in the sense uh, that the, the ability of the system to maintain its power and system efficiency uh, that would be uh, the systems uh, the extent to which the member of the system uh, um, comply with the rules of the system and the system's capacity to fulfill strategic objectives. And this can be reached to, um, so de facto, this can be reached to increased interdependence and um, inter, uh, interconnection uh, at all government structures. Um, and yeah, so I, I would say in conclusion that um, the findings of the book suggest a greater need for, um, for, uh, for increased EU autonomous competencies. Uh, and um, for the UK, it emphasizes uh, the importance of bilateral and minilateral or multilateral structures, particularly in the um, scenario of a no deal. Uh, to conclude, uh, future EU UK relations uh, will probably, or we can expect to depend on the UK's ability to normalize its relations with European partners. And um, also on its level of commitment or ability to show a commitment towards CSDP, uh, but uh, will also depend on the preferences of the EU27. So I think, uh, I think that is uh, from my side, and uh, we are now going to move on with beginning um, uh, our panel. Our first speaker is um, Alice Panier. Uh, who is assistant professor in IR and European security at um, here at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. And she will talk about um, Brexit uh, or, or the UK bilateral relations with European partners, uh, particularly with France. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you? Oh, yes. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Cornelia, for the invitation and congratulations for putting together this uh, event at, uh, in such a short time um, at, at SAIS. Um, so indeed, I'm going to talk about uh, the UK's bilateral defense and security relations with European partners and in particular um, France. But by talking about France, I hope to draw conclusions that um, apply to other um, EU member states. Uh, and, and so it could be of interest to, to um, other partners as well. So indeed, as uh, Cornelia pointed, uh, bilateral defense relations uh, have a, taken a particular uh, importance during the Brexit process. They will be potentially even more important after Brexit is effective, but they have always been extremely important, and that's why I've dedicated almost uh, the ten, ten past years uh, working on uh, bilateral defense and security relations in Europe, and in particular the UK-French uh, defense relation, and hopefully we'll have a book coming out on the, t on the subject in about uh, a year. So um, when it comes to the UK and France, 
even though um, conclusions can be applied to other cases, there is something quite special about the UK-French bilateral uh, defense uh, relation. They do enjoy some sort of special relationship, even, if, even though the, the term is connoted and, and tends to refer to the UK-US bilateral relationship. It can also, to some extent, apply to the French-UK relationship. Uh, it is unique, according to the French um, embassy in London, because it applies to all domains of defense and security, and it is special, according to the UK MOD director for general strategy, in a tweet uh, that he posted in March 2019, because uh, it uh, applies to um, nuclear deterrence as well as to the UK and France's um, military expeditionary capacities that other European states do not necessarily have. This bilateral partnership in the past 10 years has been rooted in a bilateral treaty called the Lancaster House Treaties, whereby France and the UK have committed to enhance their bilateral cooperation across the spectrum of defense and security, uh, ranging from um, joint armament projects and including uh, cross-border industrial integration, and that's an important part of their cooperation that I'm going to go back to because it's probably the one that's being the most affected by, by Brexit. Uh, they have endeavored to integrate uh, their missile industry, in particular around the company MBDA, co-owned by French and British um, industrial groups. France and the UK have also committed to enhance their um, cooperation on military operations and the interoperability of their armed forces. They have jointly led operations uh, in Libya in 2011, have together part participated in the US-led coalition in Syria, have uh, worked together uh, under French leadership in the Sahel, under UK leadership uh, in Eastern Europe, and they have built for almost 10 years now a combined joint expeditionary force, which is a um, first entry non-permanent military force uh, involving all three services that is uh, going to reach full uh, operational capacity uh, next year in 2020. France and the UK have also been collaborating in the nuclear domain, uh, nuclear deterrence domain, which makes uh, their partnership uh, indeed quite special, sharing facilities for um, the maintenance uh, of their nuclear stockpiles, as well as um, test simulation on their nuclear warheads. Uh, France and the UK obviously also are both members of the UN Security Council, and as such, they, as such, they um, engage on a lot of international security issues, and they have a common approach on um, current affairs, including on Iran, Russia or Syria. So that's for, if you like, the, um, the background of what, what I'm going to say now is going to, to build. So build, based on this bilateral, strong, all-encompassing partnership that has been reinforced for the last decade, what has happened since 2016? This microphone, I can understand if I'm supposed to speak close or far. Should I speak like this? Okay. Um, so what I said for the past three minutes was not that interesting it, anyway, so it's okay if you didn't hear anything. <laughs> so what has happened since 2016? So obviously when you have such a partnership um, that has um, no equal uh, in Europe and you have this bilateral treaty, uh, what you come up with after something like Brexit is first a disbelief on both sides, uh, as well as uh, public declarations that support the maintenance of the partnership and try to create a political atmosphere of continued uh, trust, trust and, support, and mutual support. So in 2016, when François Hollande was still president in France, he declared that France will continue to work with uh, this big friend country and that the, the close relations in the defense field will be preserved. Theresa May, similarly in July 2016, suggested that the intelligence and security cooperation between our countries is something that will always endure and that they will even strengthen the wider strategic defense partnership between uh, the two countries. So a lot of goodwill was shown at first. Then, since 2017, 2018, we have some sort of fatigue. Uh, we have Macron taking a hard line on Brexit to preserve the, um, the different pillars of the EU um, and, um, and, uh, and maintain unity uh, of the EU. And we face the fact and the problem that defense indeed is not as important or is only secondary to economic and social issues, right? So, uh, so you have defense coming... Uh, if you like, more to the back of uh, bilateral declarations and French uh, posturing, same in, on the UK side. Then with the rejection of Theresa May's deal, um, there is an increased fatigue uh, um, and disbelief on the French side of what the UK is up to. 
And then you have an increased governmental instability in the UK and with the coming uh, into power of uh, Boris Johnson, the question is, is it even worth working with Johnson? How long is he going to stay in power anyway? Uh, and the talks and, and the constant postponing of Brexit uh, make any kind of um, focus on defense and security uh, very, very difficult. So in the meantime, you do have uh, the collaboration that continues at the working level, political military cooperation, mill-to-mill -mill cooperation continues unaffected. Uh, by the political events, uh, bilateral exercises continue, deployments uh, in the e Indian Oceans of um, combined aircraft um, uh, carrier groups continue, collaboration in the Sahel in Eastern Europe and in Syria continue. Um, however, on the industrial side, uh, things have started to take a different turn. The big project of a future combat air system, a UK-French system, was abandoned, not only due to Brexit, uh, there were already many disagreements on the industrial sides, differing needs between the two countries, but it was acknowledged in all the research and interviews that I've done that a Brexit presented a sort of window of, of opportunity to just abandon a project that um, they no longer had an incentive, an incentive to maintain because of bad political context and, uh, and difficult economic context as well. And now there are many doubts about other projects, including this uh, very ambitious uh, industrial integration in the missile sector that I was mentioning earlier that is now put into question by, by Brexit. Uh, meanwhile, cooperation in the nuclear, uh, in the nuclear domain um, continues. So then, that was, if you like, for the past three years, and now we can wonder what's going to happen after uh, Brexit. And this indeed begs the question that you raised, Cornelia, about resilience. And I only have two minutes, so and I'm obviously very late. Uh, I'm going to speed up. Um, the, my point, uh, and, and that's something that I write about in, in the book that I will uh, hopefully be able to publish soon, uh, is that even for partners and neighbors that, en that um, that uh, enjoy such special relationships and very deep partnerships, those partnerships need maintenance, they need efforts. And when we think about what's going to happen next, we can think about four lines of inquiry. First is how, going, how are the two partners going to construct common interests, decide on things they want to do together. And this is going to be difficult first because of um, Brexit representing two, diff two opposing political visions. First. You have, on the one hand, you have France thinking of its future in a European context, and almost only in a European context. And on the other side, you have a UK thinking of its future individually around this idea of global Britain. So you have different political visions. You also have political tensions because of the Brexit negotiations, which creates uh, diminished incentives for negotiating common positions, common interests, and finding areas and ways to work together. Then in the... Uh, longer term, if the UK does not participate in the EU, in PESCO, the European Defence Fund, the, C the CFSP, the Common Foreign Policy meetings, there is a chance that they're not going to be able to converge on many issues that concern EU diplomacy, but maybe my colleagues will talk more about that. Um, so that's also going to uh, make it more difficult to reach common positions for procurement choices in the in, in military procurement, especially as the, e, as the EU moves forward uh, to become an actor in that field. Then there is the broader question of how willing and able the UK is going to be as a military actor. And the root of the partnership between the UK and France is that they both share this expeditionary interventionist strategic posture. And if the UK indeed is still uh, struggling with Brexit, has lower defense spending and uh, a just general loss of leadership, is it, is it still going to be a very attractive partner for France? There is also even the a risk maybe that if the UK has to negotiate trade, trade deals with uh, great powers including the US, including China, including Russia, then maybe that's going to create some entanglements for, for the UK's European partners. Second, uh, about co coordinating government to government military activities. The UK being outside of the EU will make it more difficult to work on a normative basis and regulatory basis, including and especially for defense industry, because the EU provides for a simplification of cross-border um, 
arms uh, exports and the exchange of parts necessary for building arms. So, um, so that's uh, making it difficult for uh, companies like Airbus, MBDA, uh, Thales that work on cross-border projects. It's not so much a matter of tariffs because tariffs uh, are not so um, consequent uh, in, uh, in the um, armaments um, sector. But if you have um, more paperwork, more administrative burden, as well as border checks, um, it just also removes some of the incentives of working with the UK and you may have some relocation of industry. Thirdly, and I'm reaching the end of my uh, short um, blurb, um, for, for a bilateral relationship to continue, you need to be able to make deals and including make bets. So if you want to cooperate on something, you may say, um, give me this and I'll give you that. You know, you do trade-offs and you, it's constant um, bargaining, even among close allies. And so if you have uncertainty about the future, how are you going to make a deal? You're not going to be able to bet on whether the UK tomorrow is going to, to be able to fulfill their uh, commitment to certain deals that you've made. So you're going to be in the short term disincentivized to make certain deals and that again applies in particular to armaments projects. Are you going to put money on the table if you don't know if your partner is going to be able to, um, to fulfill the obligation? Finally, and that's an important point uh, as well, is how do you arbitrate among different bilateral relationships? States at any given time entertain very close relationships with uh, different states. So the UK has obviously strong relationships with France, but also with the US and also with multiple smaller European countries or Germany as well, which is not that small. And so um, on the one hand, the UK is going to be incentivized to reinforce its bilateral links with a number of other European partners, but also with the US. And this may be detrimental to France if the US is indeed, for example, lobbying the UK as it has been doing to buy American equipment, including in the missile sector, where the UK has been trying so hard to work with France. And the, there has been a, a forceful uh, American lobbying to sell some uh, American missiles, for example, that, uh, that the UK would be otherwise developing conjunctly with France on a, on a bilateral level. Um, interestingly, this, um, this US lobbying can also be felt towards other European states as they try to find an alternative to the UK as an entry point into the EU. Um, so maybe also um, uh, other colleagues um, will we'll talk about that aspect. Um, meanwhile, France is obviously incentivized to try to look for other partners, including going, turning back to Germany, even if it's a diff difficult partner in defense, it remains uh, another um, favorite, favored uh, ally. I'm actually done, because I think I skipped just a couple of points. Uh, looking forward to um, you know, questions and comments, if there are any uh, afterwards. Thank you so much, um, Alice Panier, for your inputs. Our next speaker is um, Joan R. Denny, who is Research Professor of Joint Interagency Intergovernmental and Multinational Security Studies at the U.S. Army, College, uh, Army War College Strategic Studies Institute. He will talk about uh, Brexit, NATO, and transatlantic cooperation. Thank you. I think Cornelia used a bit of my time getting my title out. Uh, but thank you for that introduction, Cornelia. Uh, my name is John Denny. I'm a research professor at the U.S. Army War College up in uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And specifically, I work at the relatively small research uh, facility there, the Strategic Studies Institute, a small part of the, of the much larger War College. As such, I'm a government employee. We have academic freedom, but I'm a government employee, and so I have to acknowledge up front that the views I'm going to express now and during the Q&A are mine and mine alone and don't reflect those necessarily of the Army, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. Uh, first, uh, Cornelia, back to you. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Uh, and congratulations to you and John Doyle for uh, an excellent book and the publication of that book. Uh, I'm honored and delighted to be here to talk to you today about the transatlantic aspect of Brexit, or at least my, my take on it. And I'm going to talk about that in, uh, in terms of three potential uh, rather negative uh, impacts. The first of those is going to be uh, the demise of UK capability and capacity militarily. The second follows on from that, the receding of UK strategic horizons. In other words, how far beyond the borders of the United Kingdom does London perceive UK interests? Okay, Right now, that goes pretty far. 
Uh, I'm going to argue that I think we're going to see a receding of that, a pretty significant one. And then finally, and most dramatically, and here's where I'm on the thinnest ice, because I'm doing the most dangerous thing a political scientist can do, and that is predict. Uh, I think those first two things I mentioned could ultimately lead to the demise of the special relationship uh, and the demise of the UK as uh, America's right-hand partner uh, and the number two power in NATO. And I don't just mean that in terms of military issues. Uh, we Americans, as many of you know, we like to operate with partners throughout the world in all of our international dealings. Uh, and the UK is arguably the closest partner we have in a variety of realms, especially in the military. I think that uh, is uh, at risk. So let me talk about each of those now uh, in a little more detail. First, in terms of the demise of UK capability and capacity, I mean that specifically in terms of what's about to happen to the UK defense budget. Most of the reputable, uh, independent economic analyses that came out in the run-up to the Brexit vote over three years ago were fairly consistent about the impact of Brexit on the UK economy. And that was there would be a, a pretty significant negative impact, right, on GDP, on purchasing power, on household incomes. Across the board, that was, with one or two exceptions, that's what most independent analyses found. Now, they varied in terms of the depth of the bad news, right? But uh, the, Brexit, the hard Brexit was the worst case scenario. And there, most analyses averaged about a 7% drop in GDP. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but that translates into about a 47 billion pound loss of revenue. That number sounds like a lot to me, and it is. Uh, back in 2012 and 2013, when the UK government was dealing with the after effects of austerity and uh, the sovereign debt crisis, those two years saw drops in revenue of about 33 billion pounds each of those years. So 47 billion pound drop in revenue over the course of, let's say, the next five years. Most of these studies looked out five to seven years. That's a fairly significant impact. Now, how did the UK government respond to uh, the drop in revenue uh, earlier this decade? it was pretty clear that among the most severely uh, cut budget categories was defense. Uh, and from 2010 until 2018, uh, UK defense spending dropped by 18% in real terms. Uh, there was a 25% cut in manpower over that same time period. Now, there's been some recent good news about uh, what the, uh, uh, the British government is expected to fund in the coming year for uh, defense spending. Uh, and as, uh, as many of you know, we've seen kind of a rebound of defense spending across Europe, uh, at least 2015. I question the durability of that rebound, especially in the case of the UK, uh, and especially if a hard Brexit comes about. So uh, defense cuts, my view, are very likely. Uh, the government will likely do that in order to uh, fence off or protect uh, social welfare spending, as it did in the wake of the uh, sovereign debt crisis. Um, I don't think there's risk to things like uh, high-profile uh, procurement, such as uh, strategic submarines, but I, uh, I do think there's risk to other procurement programs that could be delayed or canceled outright. And here I, I'm thinking of maybe the Challenger tank replacement, uh, helicopter upgrades and replacements, uh, and pop uh, uh, possibly some general purpose frigates. Uh, we should also expect to see cuts to manpower. Uh, that's what we saw a couple of years ago. Uh, I would expect the uh, British Army and the Royal Marines to take pretty significant cuts uh, to their, their force structure. Uh, perhaps more significantly uh, for defense would be questions about whether the United Kingdom remains united in the event of a hard Brexit. Many of you know that uh, Scotland is home to the only strategic submarine base for the Royal Navy. It's also home to some fairly important uh, RAF bases. Uh, as well as uh, a training facility at Cape Wrath that the MOD, uh, the UK Ministry of Defense itself, uh, labels the only place in Europe where you can do sea, air, and land exercises, operations, all at the same time. So if Scotland were to hold a referendum in the worst case of a, of a hard Brexit, uh, trying to recreate, replicate, uh, or even lease these facilities in the short run would be extraordinarily expensive and, uh, and difficult to pull off, I think. Now, even without Brexit, let's say that we don't get a hard Brexit. Instead, uh, there's an agreement uh, between the EU and London to avoid the worst case scenario. 
We know already that austerity over the last decade has dealt a serious blow to UK military capacity and capabilities. If you think back to what the UK was possible of doing militarily, uh, back in the Persian Gulf, the first Persian Gulf War, 1991 timeframe, or uh, at the outset of NATO's involvement in Afghanistan, or uh, uh, of uh, the Coalition of the Willing's involvement in Iraq, early 2000s, okay? Those time periods, the UK military could field uh, division-sized military units. We're talking about thousands, tens of thousands, up to 20,000 or so is the size of a division of uh, mechanized forces. That is simply not possible today. And that is because of austerity. Uh, of course, the Army is not uh, the only service in the UK affected by that. We've seen a, uh, a decline in platforms, Royal Navy platforms, uh, and, the, the, and the RAF has been affected as well. In 2018, the House of Commons itself concluded that the UK military was, quote, at the minimum threshold of operational effectiveness. That's their words, not mine, unquote. That will ultimately, in my view, here's the second impact, lead to a shrinking of UK strategic horizons. Now, there are a lot of things that go into how a country perceives of where its interests lie, right? But the ability and willingness to do something about them, that's tied to this. And I look at two historical examples to indicate to me why this is most likely. The first is the Dutch. From the mid-2000s until the middle of the current decade, the Dutch went through a pretty significant military transformation. Uh, their strategies 15 years ago talked about having really worldwide interests, all in the framework or context of multilateralism, of course, right? Working with NATO or EU uh, context. Ten years later, a new strategy comes out, 2018. It, it, it states very clearly the focus is now on Europe and the kingdom, not on operations far afield. In 1990, the Dutch army had 104,000, the Dutch military had 104,000 personnel, down to 41,000 in 2011. They went from 181 F-16s in 1990 to 68 in 2011. From 913 tanks to zero. 15 frigates and destroyers to six. This reduction in capability and capacity is what contributed in part to this reframing of how the Netherlands viewed its security. Now the second example I look to historically uh, for this is ironically the UK itself. And that's what happened about 50 years ago when the UK went through this really wrenching decision to withdraw east of Suez. One of the reasons why the UK made that decision was the increasing cost of power projection platforms to maintain a presence and influence east of Suez. Now, ultimately, I think these two first factors or impacts I've mentioned to you could lead to the demise of the special relationship between the US and the UK and have profound impacts for NATO as well. Now, the special relationship is rooted in history as we know. Many of us think of that as being born in the crucible of World War II, but really extend, it extends back a little bit over a century ago to the late 1800s, early 1900s, when there was an increasing, uh, increasingly common outlook toward the world between London and Washington. And that relationship is based not simply on material factors, like whether we can operate militarily together. You all know it's based upon common language, common history, common values, right? But to the extent that it is based on material factors, and in part it is, those things are likely going to diminish over time. And by time, I mean the next five to 10 years. I think that is gonna be the case because Washington will increasingly see less utility in the relationship, in the closeness of it. Of course, the UK is gonna remain a close ally. Intel cooperation through Vive Eyes and other mechanisms will go on. Uh, America is always interested in having allies along for various international uh, pursuits and operations. But the closeness of that, this special relationship, which is already spoken of mostly in British accents, is going to, I think, uh, generally fade with time. And with there, I'll end. Thanks for listening. Thank you, John. So our next speaker is Eric Bratberg, who directs the European program at uh, Carnegie Endowment. Great. Thank you so much, Dan, and thank you, Cornelia, again. Congrats on the book, and 
thanks for having me here. So I was asked to talk a little bit about the UK's future relations with the EU, NATO, and the United States, and try to do all that in 10 minutes. What I'd like to do, though, is just kind of highlight a couple of points, maybe moving this conversation a little bit beyond just defense to talking also about broader uh, impact for, for security and, and foreign policy. So I think, to me, a starting point is just to recognize, frankly, that Brexit marks the biggest shift in UK foreign policy since at least the end of the Cold War, and it's going to have major implications for the EU, for NATO, for the United States. Um, I think you can say that traditionally British foreign policy has really been based on three sort of overlaying pillars. The first one being a part of Europe, second one maintaining a close special relationship with the United States, and also the third one being sort of an active player on the global stage supporting multilateralism. I think because of Brexit, but also because of Trump, because of rising great power competition in the international system, all of those three pillars are now in flux. So what does this mean in terms of the relationship between the UK and the EU post-Brexit? Um, I just got back from a trip to Brussels last week where I was part of strategic discussions about the future of European security. And it was noteworthy how little Brexit actually came up in those discussions. I think that's quite telling. Um, but I do think, you know, talking to Europeans, um, especially French strategic experts, um, there is this notion that Brexit actually represents an opportunity for European security and defense policy. The sort of the traditional British opposition to deepening European defense and security integration um, with Brexit now allows the EU to move forward. I think there is some truth to that, but I also think that there is some, some um, reasons to be concerned. Um, I think we have to recognize that the UK has actually uh, traditionally played a very strong role in European foreign policy uh, when it comes to back in the 1990s, addressing issues in the Western Balkans, um, pushing for enlargement to Central and Eastern Europe, leading on the EU in terms of trade policy, Russia sanctions, and so on. So I think that's, that's an important starting point, that the UK has not just blocked security and defense cooperation in Europe. It's actually played a very important role. I do think it's important to also recognize that Europe itself, leaving aside Brexit, is undergoing a really, I think, important um, major transformation where Brexit is only a part of this process um, in a world where the U.S. is no longer as predictable and a stable leader as it used to be, where the international system is becoming uh, less rules-based and more competitive. So the EU itself is undergoing this process of realigning itself, and that's why you see so much discussion coming out of Europe these days on strategic autonomy or, or the need for Euro more European sovereignty. We can come back to that. I think much in terms of the future UK-EU relationship post-Brexit obviously depends on the outcome of Brexit itself, which we don't yet know at this point. Um, so far, um, foreign policy, as others uh, highlighted, has not really been part of the Brexit conversation. In the withdrawal agreement, which uh, Theresa May negotiated with the EU, uh, this was really about the exiting from the EU part, uh, which addressed other issues, such as immigration, the UK's future financial contributions um, to, to the EU, and, and um, the backstop issue. Foreign policy was addressed in the sort of uh, part of the withdrawal agreement that talked about the future relationship. But not a whole lot of attention has actually been paid to this yet. Um, so I think much will obviously depend on whether we will see a soft Brexit or a hard Brexit or a no deal outcome at all. But it also depends on where the UK itself wants to go. Um, you know, you could, you could foresee, and others have highlighted that already, you could foresee situations where the UK will, will seek to maintain a very close relationship to the European Union after Brexit. You could also see a situation where they might pivot to the United States or try to find some equidistance between the two. Uh, that still remains to be seen. Um, when it comes to how the UK will address and, and respond to broader developments in strategic developments in Europe, um, I think it's fair to say that you have seen, again, this uh, progress in Europe on defense cooperation in the past couple of years. Um, some of these trends uh, precede Brexit, but they also come as a result of Brexit. PESCO was mentioned, the European Defense Fund, uh, the initiatives coming out of Brussels um, on strengthening European defense cooperation in many ways will treat the UK post-Brexit as a third party uh, country, and that will have important implications, not only 
in the UK's role potentially in being part of these initiatives, but also how the UK may even perceive them themselves and respond to them. Uh, will the UK be supportive or will it actually try to sort of uh, dilute some of these uh, European defense efforts and maybe even hedge against them. I think it's too early to tell. What I do think you will see is also, um, you know, UK uh, increasingly responding to deepening European defense integration and deep, uh, sort of deepening of the Franco-German axis in Europe, uh, maybe trying to offset that by investing in new relations to other countries around the continent. But it is fair to say that British influence in Europe, I think, has already diminished and it will need to be rebuilt. So the question is how the UK can go about doing that. I think here actually the UK can learn a bit from the United States, uh, which is an outside power in Europe that has long worked uh, in Europe to be, to be influential. There will be a need for London to increase its diplomatic presence in London, in key capitals across the continent, again investing especially in the rela relationship with Berlin and Paris, but also in new type of relationships, the so-called Hanseatic League of the Netherlands and the Nordic countries, um, but also Central Eastern Europe. These are sort of natural partners in Europe that the UK will have to increase its engagement with. Um, and I think ultimately the goal here should be for the UK to be um, a key partner, a special partner to the European Union, uh, but that will require some changes. We will have to find new arrangements, um, both with the Foreign Affairs Council and the, and the PSC. Uh, there will be a need for new structures and institutions and arrangements to coordinate security and defense policy. Um, but at the UK EU level, and then there will be a need to have new relationships between the UK and individual member states. Um, we've already seen this, I think, in some ways, even though Brexit hasn't happened, uh, we've already seen it as a result of the Brexit referendum, an increase in sort of E3 cooperation. Germany, France, and the United Kingdom on issues such as Iran or South China Sea or, or Hong Kong or whatever. I think this is very likely to continue uh, and even intensify uh, as a result of Brexit. And, and we could also see, I think, other formats emerging, such as the Quad format where you would bring in the United States uh, you could also see um, uh, the G7, perhaps, uh, which also includes Italy becoming more significant as a venue for having security and foreign policy uh, discussions that brings in the UK. Of course, President Macron has floated this idea of a European Security Council that would be a sort of deliberative body to discuss uh, foreign policy issues, sort of like an EU Security Council, although it's very unclear what it actually means. I think these type of ideas, once we get a better sense of where Brexit is heading, uh, will very much be where the discussions is going to go. Uh, the state of play right now is, of course, still quite uncertain because we don't know where Brexit will actually end up. And I think it's, if anything, it seems that not only the Europeans are a little bit hesitant to put the security and defense issues on the agenda, I think in many ways the UK itself, because of its negotiating tactics, is maybe trying to use security and defense as some leverage right now to to get the Europeans to get to a deal. Ultimately, um, in my view, it is really essential um, that, um, um, that the UK and the EU find this future arrangement uh, because it's, it's, it's pivotal for um, not only the UK, but it's also pivotal for Europe, I think, in a world that's increasingly multipolar, where the transatlantic relationship is in flux, where we have rising authoritarian countries such as China and Russia, uh, for Europe to stick together, for cohesion, uh, but also for Europe's clout in the world, with the UK as Europe's at least second biggest military power, major economic force, major diplomatic um, actor to maintain that close relationship to to the Europeans. I have some other points too about NATO and the US, but um, maybe we'll, we'll just shelf them for now. I've already talked for eight minutes, so we can come back to discuss a little bit more the impact for NATO and then the specific impact for, for the United States. Thank you so much, uh, Eric Bratberg, for your uh, inputs. Uh, now I'd like to uh, invite uh, I'm the um, ambassador of the Republic of Ireland to the United States uh, to talk us on uh, to uh, tell us uh, um, some um, uh, or uh, yeah to tell us something on uh, the effects of brexit on the northern <coughs> ireland peace process and the good friday agreement before doing this i uh, wanted to say briefly um, uh, that before coming to washington um, daniel muhal was ambassador as was already mentioned to uh, germany and the uk and he is also author of the book A New Do uh, Day Downing, a portrait of uh, Ireland uh, in uh, 1900 and co-editor of The Shaping of Modern Ireland, a Centenary Assessment. 
Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador Muhal, for sharing uh, your knowledge with us today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Adriana, uh, Cornelia, Adriana, um, Batu. Um, and uh, I just want to say, first of all, that I am very glad to be associated with the launch of this book because um, it's a book that uh, was co-edited by two academics, um, Cornelia um, Batu and um, uh, John Doyle, both um, at the time of the book's production, um, academics at Dublin City University. And indeed, I'd like to commend the, the chapter on uh, Northern Ireland and the Brexit uh, issue, because it uh, not only does it cover that issue very, very well indeed, but it's also a very good introduction, I think, a short but very concise introduction to the, the nature of the issues that arise in Northern Ireland, the different traditions that have, that have um, been in conflict for some time in Northern Ireland, and that conflict uh, has to be, uh, any resurgence of that conflict needs to be avoided at all costs. Um, just to say that um, Ireland is a country, um, and this book is, uh, has a focus on defence and security. Um, I'll be focusing on Northern Ireland and on the, the political challenges uh, and the economic challenges facing Ireland in the context of Brexit. Um, from the point of view of defence, Ireland is not a member of NATO. We have a traditional policy of military neutrality. We have also been heavily involved in United Nations peacekeeping. We have an unbroken record now of 60 years involvement in UN peacekeeping um, and a very significant percentage of our um, armed forces are deployed on, on, um, on um, UN missions in various parts of the world and also in recent years our uh, naval vessels have been involved in the Operation Sophia in uh, the Mediterranean uh, combined with other European countries uh, rescuing uh, migrants. Um, our, our, our three latest naval vessels um, they, um, uh, they take turns in, in um, being deployed in the Mediterranean, and the three vessels are called after three Irish writers, the um, W.B. Yeats, the um, Samuel Beckett, and, and the James Joyce. So we're probably the only country in the world that calls our naval vessels uh, after our, our great Irish writers. So just to say that, um, um, why should Americans be concerned about Brexit? Well, for me, there are two good, very good, strong reasons. The first is that the European Union is part of the fabric of transatlantic relations. And I'm talking about now not just the security and defence relationship, but the broader um, shared value system and the shared interests that, combine, that, that bind Europeans and Americans and have done so for the last 70 years since the Second World War, very successfully indeed. And therefore, anything that damages the European Union is a negative for the United States. And those here who might take pleasure in the decline or in, in the Brexit as a, as a hit to the European Union are really, I think, um, also um, taking pleasure in what would be a hit to the transatlantic relationship and ultimately also to the United States. Because the European Union has been part of the transatlantic relationship, which has provided, which has provided over a period, an unprecedented period, of peace and prosperity in, in Western Europe uh, for the last 70 years. The second reason is economic, in that the relationship, the economic relationship between the EU and the United States is by far the most important economic relationship in the world in terms of the volume of trade and investment that flows back and forth across the Atlantic is second to none. Now, of course, there are other relationships in the world that are developing and emerging, but none of them for the foreseeable future will match the transatlantic economic relationship. Now, you get different views uh, from different economists on the likely impact of Brexit economically, but I, the impact, the predicted impact ranges from moderately bad to bad to very bad to catastrophic. And I, I know of almost no serious economists who believe that Brexit will produce an economic dividend either for the UK or for the European Union. So in that context, if the EU economy is damaged because of Brexit, if the UK economy is damaged because of Brexit, then the overall damage will also be felt in the United States because the economic relationship between Europe and the United States will suffer accordingly. And that, I think, I think is, is, is these are the two very good reasons why uh, why, European, uh, why Americans should be concerned uh, and worried about the impact of Brexit in political, strategic and economic terms.
Now, from an Irish point of view, we are deeply committed to EU membership and we will remain part of the European Union come what may. Whatever happens to Brexit, in fact, support for the European Union in Ireland has risen significantly in Ireland. It has done so also in other parts of Europe, but it's risen significantly in Ireland since the um, Brexit issue um, became such a preoccupation uh, in, in Britain and in Ireland because of the impact on Ireland. And the, and, and the support for European Union membership in Ireland now is in excess of 90%. I think the last poll I saw put it at 92%, and practically nothing in the world uh, in any democratic country enjoys a 92% support. So, so basically, uh, there, is a, there is a unanimity in Ireland, and all political parties share the view that Ireland's interests are best served by membership of the European Union. And the reason for that is quite straightforward. Uh, when we joined the EU in 1973, we were by far... The, the least developed economy in Europe. Uh, we were well behind the other member states. And over the last 45 years, we've caught up. And now on a GDP per capita basis, Ireland is one of the top two or three uh, countries in the European Union. So it has transformed our country economically, but also socially in that we become much more open, much more um, attuned really to European mores. And uh, the best example of that, I suppose, is the demographic transformation of Ireland over the last 20 years. The Ireland I grew up in um, was practically homogeneously Irish. I mean, there maybe had, we had two or three percent of the population at that time who were born outside of Ireland. They were mainly retired people who'd come back to Ireland uh, or who'd come to Ireland uh, in retirement. Today, we have about 17% of our population were born outside of Ireland, which means that we are among the, uh, we have among the largest um, percentages, highest percentages in Europe of people in our country born outside of Ireland. And, and if you go to any of the big corporations, the big US corporations in Dublin, Google, um, Facebook, uh, Amazon and so forth, you will find that their workforces are multinational. Uh, Google told me recently that they have 66 language, uh, uh, languages spoken uh, by native speakers in their offices in Dublin. So the other thing about Brexit, or the other thing about Brexit is that it's a tragedy for British-Irish relations because when we joined the European Union, in 1973, we joined for, because we saw it as a, an opportunity to advance our economic interests and to advance the, the interests of our country as a whole. We probably didn't anticipate that it would have a benign effect on British-Irish relations, but it had. Because for 45 years, British and Irish diplomats and officials from different ministries have been sitting around the same tables in Brussels discussing EU issues. And guess what? the Irish and the British found themselves very often on the same side. Something they possibly hadn't imagined that would happen, but it did happen. And I can remember also back in the 1980s and 90s attending European councils when our respective prime ministers would get together in the European Union buildings at European councils and would have private discussions to try and resolve some of the issues that were hindering progress at that time in Northern Ireland. So this benign effect um, allowed us in 1998 to find ourselves, to develop a shared analysis of the conflict in Northern Ireland. And that led on to an agreement, the Good Friday Agreement of 1998, that was um, agreed with considerable support from the United States, most notably the contribution of President Clinton, but also many members of Congress and uh, on both sides of the aisle, and of course uh, the chairmanship of Senator George Mitchell. So Ireland, therefore, was not happy to find Brexit coming on to the agenda in Britain. And I was there at the time, and initially uh, it looked as if there might never be a referendum. Then the referendum was called. Our hope was that uh, the referendum would result in a Remain uh, majority. I pointed out, I, did, I was very active 
at the time uh, in uh, not campaigning in any way for for Remain, but pointing out the challenges that Ireland would face and that would be faced in Northern Ireland if Britain were to decide to leave the European Union. Sadly, the British electorate, that issue of Northern Ireland didn't really ever capture um, um, significant attention. It was, it was an issue that, that, that really didn't, didn't feature on, on the first page of people's concerns during the debate about Brexit. So we hoped that Britain would decide to remain in the European Union, but we accepted the result that they, um, the people of Britain decided um, by a 52% to 48 to leave the European Union. And from then on, our aim was to, to minimise the downsides of Brexit for Ireland and to maximise any upsides. And the upsides would include increased US investment in Europe. We reckon that about 70 or so companies have moved to Ireland because of Brexit, and we expect that trend to continue. So there will be a benefit, but the risk is, of course, that the, the economic downside of Brexit will be greater than any upside that might arise in terms of increased US investment and increased uh, foreign investment in Ireland because we will now be the only English-speaking country in the European Union after the United Kingdom leaves. And um, so the, the challenge for Ireland with Brexit is that is, is twofold. There's an economic challenge and there's a political challenge. The economic challenge is that while Britain is no longer our number one trading partner. Actually, our number one trading partner now is the United States. Uh, and Britain only accounts for about 12% of Irish exports. The United States for about 25% because of the, the huge number of US multinational companies that are operating in Ireland. But the problem is that in some sectors of our economy, notably the food industry, agriculture, uh, the figure, the percentage of exports going to Britain is probably more like 40% or sometimes even more than that. So, for example, um, and this is one of the things which uh, last week, um, uh, because of the Airbus dispute, tariffs were imposed by the United States on a range of European products, including uh, butter from Ireland. And this will be a double hit for, for farmers in Ireland, for dairy farmers, because Brexit could well disrupt exports uh, of dairy products to Britain as well. And the tariffs uh, imposed by the United States, therefore, were deeply unwelcome in that context. And I pointed that out to the American administration. Um, so... So that's the economic problem. And our government yesterday um, uh, announced our budget for 2020, and they provided for 1.2 billion euros, about $1.5 billion, to cope with the potential effects of, of Brexit, which will be particularly severe if it happens to be a hard Brexit or a no-deal Brexit. But the main concern, I suppose, that has attracted most international attention is the concern to do with Northern Ireland. Now, I mentioned how big a role the United States played in um, bringing about peace in Northern Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement. Um, that was 20 years ago now. And probably that agreement has saved thousands of lives because in the 20 years before 1998, probably 2,500 people lost their lives and many, many more were injured and maimed in incidents, in violent incidents in Northern Ireland. For the last 20 years, we've had a few sad incidents, sad tragic events like the, the killing of a young journalist uh, in April of this year uh, at a demonstration in, in uh, Derry where shots were fired at the police and this young journalist was sadly killed. But by and large, uh, the peace has, has been maintained. Um, but of course, politically, there's great fragility because... The government of Northern Ireland, which is a part of the Good Friday Agreement, which has to have unionists and nationalists involved in it, hasn't functioned since uh, 2017. So for two and a half years, there hasn't been a government in Northern Ireland. And that means that the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement cannot operate in the way they're meant to operate under the terms of that agreement. So a vacuum has been created. And when you have a vacuum, of course, it does encourage other actors to insert themselves into that vacuum. And we have seen greater evidence in recent years and months of um, renewed activity by um, small but nonetheless quite dangerous uh, paramilitary organizations. So we are very concerned that on top of that fragility and instability in Northern Ireland, 
uh, the the Brexit issue enters into the the mix and churns things up further. And that's why we have been determined from the very beginning that whatever happens with Brexit, we need to ensure that we protect the Good Friday Agreement and the open border on the island of Ireland. Now, let me just talk, talk to you about the border for a moment. For the last 20 odd years, there hasn't been a border on the island of Ireland. At one stage, there was a customs border, but that was in past times when the amount of trade and traffic between north and south was limited. Today, it's very substantial indeed. And then there was a security border during the uh, conflict between 1970 and 19, uh, the early 1990s. Uh, since that time, the border has been open. Now, the border in Ireland is not a straight line. It, um, it goes for 300 miles, and there are 200 separate border crossings on the island of Ireland. So it goes through homes, it goes through farmyards, it goes through villages, it goes through open fields. It has no geographical basis. And the problem is that if the United Kingdom leaves the European Union with no arrangement for future relations, which would be the, the impact of a no-deal Brexit, it would mean that there would be two customs and two regulatory zones on the island of Ireland. And that would mean that somehow the Irish government would have to find ways of protecting the integrity of the European single market, to which we're deeply committed because we benefit hugely from the single market. So the aim over the last two years of negotiation has been to find a way in which Britain can leave in an orderly manner, but with guarantees that there can never be a border on the island of Ireland. That was called the backstop, which was included in the withdrawal agreement negotiated last year between the EU and the UK, but rejected by the Westminster Parliament. The backstop is essentially an insurance policy that whatever happens, if all else fails, there will be no border, hard border on the island of Ireland because Britain as a whole, the UK as a whole, would remain within the customs union. This is controversial in British politics and it's proven to be difficult to get agreements. Now, the present situation, and for us, the best solution would be for the UK to leave the EU with a deal, with an agreement, that would include the backstop that was included in the withdrawal agreement agreed last year, or some agreed alternative that would achieve the same outcome as the backstop. In other words, guarantee an open border, protect the Good Friday Agreement, and respect the integrity of the European single market. The British government has recently made some uh, proposals. These proposals have been found wanting by the European Union, but the negotiations continue. And our government has said, and European governments have said, they all want to see Britain leave in an orderly fashion. Nobody wants to see a crash out Brexit, because this kind of thing has never happened before. No country, in my view, in my experience, in my knowledge, has ever left a free trade agreement of the kind that exists within the European Union without any provision to govern trade between that country and the other members of that free trade area. But that is what a hard Brexit, that is what a, a, a no-deal Brexit would entail. For example, the United States has sought to replace the NAFTA agreement with USMCA. But until USMCA comes into effect, there will be an agreement to govern trade between the NAFTA countries. It's called NAFTA. Because it would be turbulent, it would create enormous difficulty for US exporters if suddenly you went from having NAFTA to having nothing. But the risk is that Britain will go from having EU membership, the single market, to having nothing. Now, our Prime Minister will meet, our Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar, will meet the British Prime Minister uh, tomorrow uh, in England. He's going across to the north of England to, uh, to meet him. And we are committed to trying to find a solution. But sadly, there's a lot of toxic politics that surrounds the Brexit issue at the moment. And while a no-deal Brexit ought to be a 0% possibility, sadly, 
the percentage risk of a no-deal Brexit is far greater than that, which is why we're so preoccupied with this issue and why we earnestly hope that an agreement can somehow be found to enable the UK to leave the European Union, but in an orderly fashion, which minimises damage to the Irish economy, to Northern Ireland, to the peace process and to the European Union. Thank you very much. Okay, now we can hear. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Ambassador. So let me, uh, we're going to come now into some of the discussion. Let me, though, just circle back to actually to our topic, which we said was about European security and transatlantic relations. And just as another American voice, briefly compliment what John had said, which he focused really on the UK and the bilateral relationship. So just to provoke everyone and to put out a couple last points here, uh, you know, my, my brief point would be, the, the short-term impact is to, going to be to strengthen NATO because the UK will want to show, it's not leaving NATO, it's leaving the EU, that it's still part of the group. And most everyone else will want to reinforce that view. But over the medium term, for reasons John said, it's likely to weaken NATO. It's also likely to increase the importance for the United States of non-EU Europe. Uh, think about the three points of policy uncertainty right now for the United States and Europe. The UK, Turkey, and Ukraine. Uh, none of them are in the EU. And all of them are right now embroiling our own politics. And that's going to continue. Uh, the second is that this is going to put further pressure on the debate about defense expenditures because once the UK leaves uh, the EU, 80% of NATO defense expenditures, the defense of Europe, is going to be provided by non-EU countries, non-continental European countries. Uh, that's only going to further inflame the current debates that we're having right now. If you think about what we've done in NATO recently is to pr provide a forward presence in the Baltics and in Poland, three of the four battalions that lead those uh, three of the four uh, countries leading those battalions are non-continental European, are non-continental states, Canada, U.S., and the U.K. Uh, and, and there's just going to be greater debate about where is continental Europe in its own defense as we go forward as the U.K. steps back uh, from this. I'm saying, speaking from an American perspective. I think it's also going to further challenge the ability to forge cohesive European foreign and defense policies uh, on common challenges, which will mean for the Americans, for the United States, it'll further challenge Europe's ability to be the kind of partner Americans look to uh, to face a whole range of common challenges uh, beyond Europe, not just uh, in Europe. Um, and it means that Europeans are going to be f further focused inward on more process and so more internal governmental arrangements of how to deal with all of this uh, which means less time and space in the policy realm for issues that are important uh, to the United States. It's a message also that what one thought was one of the most stable democracies in the world suddenly reveals itself to be terribly polarized and fractured uh, and fragile. Uh, and I'm not sure whether that's a message that will be contained uh, to the UK. Uh, so. My conclusion is we're facing a more fluid and less settled Europe. We're facing one that is less cohesive, uh, more, um, uh, uh, more open-ended in terms of where it's going, less capable, more open to what the George Bush administration called disaggregation, playing Europeans off against each other because it's so easy to do. Um, and a Europe that's less Merkel, uh, but more German. Um, and that this disruption will not end with whatever the solution is to the UK-EU issue. It will continue beyond that because there's so many other follow-on issues that will flow from whatever, uh, whether it's no deal or some deal, Brexit. Uh, and we haven't even begun to even formulate the questions 
uh, to that, much less have answers to it. So I hope I provoke somebody now uh, on this, and we're going to open up to discussion. I think we have maybe another microphone that works, uh, either to the ambassador, since he's here, and, uh, or our other panelists, or comments you'd like uh, to make. If you can identify yourself briefly, uh, just so we, uh, people have a sense of where you're coming from, that would be helpful. Okay, who'd like to go? Okay, Jeff. Jeff Stacey, um, I, when I was at the State Department, I did EU um, NATO issues and then worked with Dan at CTR and Eric a, a few years ago now. But um, I'd like to ask the panelists about a couple of things that uh, didn't quite fully come up, but I uh, wanted to particularly thank the ambassador for emphasizing the tragedy of this, which for an American who used to work for uh, former Prime Minister uh, Edward Heath and helped him write his memoirs, did the three chapters uh, on negotiating the UK's entrance to Europe way back in the late 60s and early 70s. Question number one is why, when intelligence officials seem to believe that the Russian role in the Brexit vote was even more decisive than it was here, have the Brits had such a hard time, even harder than we have, dealing with this issue? And were they too do so, how would it be impacting the Brexit debate? And second, why are we assuming that Brexit is necessarily a done deal when there's enormous difficulty happening in London as we speak? Multiple things are coming to a head. Boris Johnson hasn't won a single vote. Cross-party majority dealt Theresa May three failing historic votes on the Brexit bill. And then finally, if it does happen, Dan, could you say a little more perhaps about um, is there potential for the UK and NATO to develop a particular command or leadership of commands or a special, will it, will it almost be forced to maintain to the best of its ability some specific kind of capability that others don't have that it could be a leader on? Okay. Since we have limited time, what I'd like to do is, uh, with the variance of our panelists, is let's collect some questions so we can get everyone more involved. Here, right down here in front. Hi, uh, I'm Brittany Gibson. I'm a journalist and also a British citizen. Um, I, my you, question I'm sorry, is, speak right, as close as you can at the mic. Thank is you. Is this better? Yeah. Oh, great. My question is for the whole panel, but I think um, the ambassador might be best suited to answer. Uh, in terms of the Irish backstop and the border it could create, uh, or the border it would not create on the island of Ireland, um, the arguments against the backstop suggest that there would be a, a border created within the United Kingdom. Uh, it's a bit of a two-part question, just what are the concerns, if any, of that other border that could be created, not on the island, of course, but within the UK, and also the difference between these two borders, it seems, is the pressure of violence that could come from them, specifically from the IRA is what I'm thinking of, um, which is only associated with the border in Ireland, if I'm correct, uh, and the island of Ireland. Um, and so what is the Irish government doing to prepare to combat that kind of domestic terrorism? Okay, over here. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Hyde, formerly of the State Department. Um, I uh, wanted to ask you, you've given us all of the, uh, the presentations have given us some, some, a lot of institutional things to think about. I wonder if you might um, talk a little bit about a couple of specific foreign policy challenges and priorities for the EU and how that will be affected by Brexit. I'm thinking of things as diverse as uh, Afghanistan, Libya, confronting the Russians. Uh, other elements of the Middle East, or, or I mean, take your pick. I just think in, in all of those areas, Brexit's going to have a real impact, and I'd be interested if if you could just share thoughts on one or two of those issues. Thank you. Thank you. All right, here, please. Um, I'm first year student from. Africa. Can you speak right into the microphone, please? Hi, panelists. I'm first year student from Alice School. Uh, I'm going to ask. Do you think the uh, constitutional crisis in UK emerged from the uh, Brexit will spread to other continental European, co European countries, therefore raise further 
broader domestic conflict throughout the European uh, continents. Okay, well, the crisis spread. So, any other? Uh, otherwise, we'll close. So, uh, Mr. Ambassador, I'd like to maybe just go to you first for anything you'd like. I don't think anyone should feel compelled to answer every single question. Uh, we'll, we'll end up answering by the time we're done. Well, look, I, I just, um, I suppose, um, mainly the question about the Irish backstop and its implications, but uh, also the question about, um, you know, is Brexit a done deal? Well, frankly, that's a matter really for, for the UK. I mean, we want to see um, the best possible outcome uh, to Brexit. And for us, if the UK were to decide to remain in the EU, but that's a matter for them, we would be very happy, I'm sure. All European countries would rejoice if that were to happen, but that's not really uh, in, in our hands. As to the issue of uh, possible Russian involvement, I, I don't believe that's ever really been properly explored, and I mean, I'm, I, 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 and I'm not sure if, if at this stage that, that would make uh, there's, there's much uh, scope in that because you know we're now getting to the end game, and I think. Um, uh, we don't know where the end game will, you know, will end up, but it's, but, but I don't think uh, that that going back and rerunning the 2016 referendum is likely to 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 commend itself to to many people um, at this point. Uh, this is a, you ask a serious question about, uh, yeah, about the backstop. I mean, th th there is no. First of all, whatever happens with Brexit. Northern Ireland will remain part of the United Kingdom. That's absolutely clear. Um, and nobody wants to pose a question about Northern Ireland's status within the UK. That is covered by the Good Friday Agreement, which provides for the possibility or the option of having a referendum at some time in the future when certain conditions are met on Irish unity. But until then, we fully accept it's, it's part of our I mean, it's firmly part of the Good Friday Agreement that Northern Ireland remains part of the UK until um, the people of Northern Ireland decide otherwise in a referendum. We're not pressing for a referendum at this stage. We, we think it would be, it would complicate an already very complicated and fraught situation. But the future, we have to see when, you know, when that issue will become a, um, a prospect or a reality. But that, that is a matter for, uh, for decision beyond the horizon of Brexit. Um, I mean, as far as um, um, nobody will be justified in resorting to violence, regardless of what happens uh, with Brexit. So the Irish government is completely clear on that. You know, comp and, and I mean, the, the organizations that would, might threaten some kind of violence are very small splinter groups from the Irish Republican movement, um, and they have little or no support anywhere in Ireland, but that doesn't stop them from being dangerous. The risk is that uh, if you have any kind of border infrastructure uh, on the island of Ireland, that elements like that will take the opportunity of attacking, of targeting those uh, facilities, and that could then cr create a, a, an escalation you know, that could be problematic in a place like Northern Ireland where passions still run quite high on these issues. But there is no um, uh, sense in which we want to see a border on the, on the Irish Sea. Um, what, what, I think what is required is some way of ensuring that the open border on the island of Ireland doesn't undermine the single market because we are committed to respecting the integrity and to preserving the integrity of the single market. Okay, so we're cl closing here in our time. So what I would suggest to our panelists, one issue, one minute. <clears throat> All right, I'll respond to the question about uh, whether NATO and the UK might develop some sort of special arrangements in order to try to, I think I gathered your question was, try to maintain its role, and its importance within the alliance. Uh, I don't think that's likely to happen. I don't think the alliance uh, will, would pursue something like that. The UK, of course, will hang on to... Um, as desperately as it can, all of the force structure, infrastructure, uh, et cetera, that it ha has within its borders uh, for NATO. So uh, I wouldn't expect that to change, but um, as we've discussed, and I think as, as Dan mentioned, I think that the outlook for the UK's role in NATO as the sort of this 
second fiddle uh, is bleak. And I don't think there's much, frankly, the Alliance can do about that. Thank you. I would concur and also I, I'm, I may disagree actually with you, Dan, on, right. on, on, on NATO, on the American view on how NATO is uh, reinforced by, by the UK leaving the EU. I think I, I uh, subscribe to what John said about the UK's diminished abilities. And I mean, NATO has other problems to deal with. I mean, you know, what's happening in Syria today is catastrophic. And we have obviously an American president that's also um, causing problem for the alliance. So I don't think that the alliance is in a good shape, but I don't think that the UK's exit from the EU is going to make it stronger in any way. Um, on the, the one point that I wanted to maybe tackle is uh, from, the, from, from you, sir, about um, the, um, the, the EU's foreign policy priorities and how that may change with Brexit. I don't see much of a change there, to be honest. Um, one reason being that the EU's main tools are either tools to which the UK did not contribute much or to which it could still contribute as a third country partner uh, in the future, whether it is uh, civil military uh, operations can totally uh, include some, some third parties. Um, development aid can be if not uh, done together, at least coordinated in a way, uh, hopefully that, that, that both uh, parties can agree. Similarly with uh, economic sanctions, um, you know, there's going to be a continued coordination, I guess, on, on uh, Russia uh, sanctions. Um, there is a risk, obviously, of a longer term drift, but in the, in the next, say, five years, uh, I don't see uh, the EU foreign policy either changing radically as a result of Brexit or the EU's foreign policy ability being so diminished. Uh, as a result of Brexit, and I will stop here. There, oh, there is also increased EU-NATO cooperation for which everyone should rejoice instead of constantly, you know, um, saying that uh, it's one against the other. Yeah, um, I, I completely agree with Alice on the impact on foreign policy, at least in the short term. Um, I mean, I think it's more of a dilemma actually for the UK itself than it is for the EU. I mean, I think the UK is in a very uh, difficult position vis-a-vis uh, uh, the United States has been previously discussed, um, especially on an issue like China, for instance, where you have, you know, one of the notions of Brexit was to pursue global Britain, have trade agreements with countries around the world, such as China, and now with the Trump administration very much, you know, leaning in, pushing uh, Britain and other European countries to, to, to um, uh, take a tougher approach towards China. That is really po posing a dilemma, I think, for, for London. Um, it's posing a dilemma for Europe as well, but Europe as a collective bloc, I think, is better able to handle that. So I think that sort of illustrates, I think, the, the sort of uh, irony with Brexit here is that it actually makes the UK less sovereign in a world of, of, of big dogs uh, when, you're, when you're a medium-sized power. I think just very quickly on, on the question about will there be contagion and more Brexits, I think very clearly for any foreseeable future, the answer is clearly no. If anything, uh, the, the tumultuous Brexit negotiations and the prospects facing uh, the UK has, has simply you know, led to the notion of, of exiting the EU becoming unthinkable. And that's why you're seeing countries uh, and the population, uh, the, the opinion polls in countries becoming more favorable towards the EU. And even some of the far right movements uh, in, in Le Pen and France and others uh, no longer longer openly advocating leaving the EU as such or leaving the Eurozone, but rather maybe trying to change the EU from within. But that, I think, is something that is far more easier to handle than, than, than would there be more Brexits. Thank you, and I will try to be very short. Um, I think it was, uh, there was a question related to the Russian. Yeah. Uh, I think there was a question related to Russian influence. Um, so from my uh, perspective, uh, with my background in political science and as, as a political science researcher, um, I think this um, is very interesting because it emphasizes the importance, the increasing importance or the increasing unpredictability of developments. And um, um, as we know, Brexit and uh, the other event was uh, the election of Donald Trump in the US. Um, have been two examples of events which uh, were uh, failed to be prevented, um, predicted by opinion polls. And um, I think this raises a, que a question um, and uh, it also makes it, makes it interesting for research in the future to find new ways to, um, um, yeah, to, to try to estimate um, citizens' attitudes and um, people's opinions which are important for political outcomes. Um, and the second point I would like to make is in relation to uh, future relations. Um, and 
So according to the alliance theory, um, the alliance theory predicts that uh, when there are two actors which have a common matrix or a similar matrix of, uh, secu or, of security threats and the similar uh, are exposed to a similar constellation of threats, uh, plus the weak commitment of a common ally, uh, the alliance theory predicts a strategic alignment between these two actors. Now, if we were to uh, apply this to our case, um, um, in this case we have the UK and Europe uh, exposed to a similar constellation of threats. Um, we, we have seen the US recently withdrawing from um, several agreements. Um, so we could expect both the UK and Europe aiming to a strategic alignment even after Brexit. Um, and, uh, but we need to emphasize that at uh, the time of this uh, talking, um, our discussions are counterfactually because uh, we do not uh, yet know whether there will be um, a UK withdrawal from the EU uh, with an agreement, uh, whether there will be a postponement of Brexit, whether there will be a, a, a no deal. So, um, yeah, everything um, should be um, um, yeah, um, thought in these terms as a counterfactual analysis. Thank you. Thank you. So the, <clears throat> this one point, on the, for, from a U.S. point of view, if you think of the EU member states, the only two countries really have had this broader strategic horizon uh, historically and in recent past, and that's the U.K. and France. Uh, and I think to answer Andrew's question, I think, Jeff, <clears throat> without that U.K. voice within the EU, France is going to find it very lonely and that the strategic horizons of the EU will narrow. And what France will have to fight that, but I think it'll find it hard. Uh, and I think for a US point of view, that's not gonna be good. So on that happy note, <coughs> th Cornelia, thank you so much for bringing us all together. Uh, I wish you great success with your book. Everyone go buy it, please. Uh, and uh, we hope you it's good reading for you. Mr. Ambassador, thank you again for joining us. We are present, and our panelists, uh, please join me in thanking them. <coughs> we have a, a reception here next door. If anyone would like to continue the conversation with our panelists or with each other, come and join us. So thank you again for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>